Psalm 22. All righty. Let's, uh, I'm going to read uh, basically um, uh, well, I'm going to read a portion of this to start with. <coughs> and depending on how it goes, we'll deal with the other half, <coughs> either the second class, or if I can read a lot, then we'll deal with the whole psalm, this, this class. <coughs> psalm 22, verse 1, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why art, why art thou so far from helping me and from the words of my roaring? O oh my God, I cry in the daytime, but thou hearest not, and in the night season, and am, and am not silent. But thou art holy, O thou who inhabitest the praises of Israel. Our fathers trusted in thee. They trusted, and thou didst deliver them. They cried unto thee and were delivered. They trusted in thee and were not confounded. But I am a worm and no man, a reproach of men and despised of the people. All they who see me laugh me to scorn. They shoot out the lip, they shake the head, saying, He trusted on the Lord that he would deliver him. Let him deliver him, seeing he delighteth in him. But thou art he who took me out of the womb. <clears throat> thou didst make me hope upon my mother's breast. I was cast upon thee from the womb. Thou art my God from my mother's body. Be not far from me, for trouble is near, for there is none to help. Many bulls of Bashan have compassed me, strong bulls, of, or sorry, many bulls have compassed me, strong bulls of Bashan have beset me um, round. They gaped upon me with their mouths like a ravening and roaring lion. I am poured out like water and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax, it is melted within me. My strength is dried up like a potsherd. My tongue cleaveth to my jaws, and thou hast brought me into the dust of death. For dogs have compassed me, the assembly of the wicked have enclosed me, they pierced my hands and my feet. I count all my bones, they look and stare upon me. They part my garments among them and cast lots upon my vesture. But be thou not far from me, O Lord, O my strength. Haste thee to help me. Deliver my soul from the sword, my only one, from the power of the dog. Okay, we'll read that much. <clears throat> now, I know you're going to look at me funny, but I think this psalm also is about the cross. I know, but, uh, you know, so far we keep saying that, that over and over, and, you know, it's just getting harder and harder to believe me, but uh, um, so many of these verses are actually quoted by Jesus on the cross, <clears throat> and um, depending on how it goes, I want to point out <clears throat> two different things. The part that I read is the sufferings of Christ or the manner in which he suffers. And part two will begin at the verse that I left off, which is verse 21, or actually, uh, uh, it actually begins in verse 22. And it is the resurrection side. And in the resurrection side of this psalm, what we discover is the praises of Jesus. I think that's important to hear because most of us are familiar with the sufferings of Jesus. But we need to also hear the praises of Jesus or what does he praise about? You know, that's, that's important because we, we hear the praises of man all the time. But what is it that Jesus actually motivates him to praise about in the midst of the congregation? 
All right, so let's see how this goes as far as how far I can get. Um, obviously, verse 1, <clears throat> my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Uh, we'll get into this a little more about the forsaken part. Uh, verse uh, 3, but, but thou art holy, O thou whom inhabitest the praises of Israel. And here, he, th- you got to remember two things. <clears throat> Number one, this is David writing this. And, and here's the part I fear that I will have to do this whole psalm first in this class and then the second class finish the second side. It's because the things that need commenting on. For example, uh, this is a deep uh, launch into the cross by David, who is saying the same things Jesus said. It is a man who is experiencing these things. Uh, I was meditating on the book of Hebrews when it said of Moses that he chose the afflictions of Christ more treasure than the riches of Egypt. And I was thinking, did he know Christ? And apparently he did. Because he chose the affliction of Christ back then. See, we say, oh, the cross, the two pieces of wood. That's where Jesus showed up. But he he was and he is and is to come. He, He was... As it were, I'll say it like this. He was in David or he was, David was aware of the um, sufferings that he was going through. That they were deeper than just his own situation. Uh, It says of uh, Israel in the wilderness. It says that they tempted Christ. Well, they didn't know, or did they? Or, Or... Clearly, he was there, right? I mean, it says they tempted Christ. It didn't say they tempted God. It didn't say Moses chose the affliction of God. It says that this Jesus has always been rejected. It didn't start at the cross. It started all the way back, you know, I mean, in the beginning of time. Men may not fully understand it. Because, let's face it, the ones who put Jesus to death and the ones who cried crucified him, they didn't look and say, we are putting afflictions on the Christ. Right? They didn't, they, the best way to handle that is to say, you know, I don't believe that he's... The issue with God isn't how much we believe... J-E-S-U-S, the the name, C-H-R-I-S-T, the name. It is, do we have enough discernment and reality working in us that we can discern that that, this issue is not dealing with man. This is dealing with Christ. For example, Israel in the will, we are not tempting, just tempting Moses or God in general. We are tempting Christ. Moses in Egypt, I am choosing the afflictions. Not just, he's not just choosing the afflictions, folks. He's choosing that greater riches than all the treasures of Egypt. Okay. Now, that's a hard one for some people to understand until you un- be caught. And here's why. <clears throat> because we're human and we think as humans. And so we think in terms of suffering when we didn't do anything wrong, is one of the worst crimes. Shall I say it again? (laughs) We think as humans, and we think to suffer for someone else's crimes when they did wrong and I didn't, is one of the worst things that can happen to us. God thinks that one of the highest things. 
Didn't Jesus come die the, the just for the unjust? Didn't every one of us come into the kingdom of God based on one thing, a dying lamb that chose those afflictions and, and didn't just choose them. You know, they, he chose these afflictions as more treasure than being selfish and getting everything you want. All right. Now I know, and I know that's a good theory. <laughs> I mean, I know it's a good theory. I know that it's worthy of an amen. amen. It's worthy of an amen. That, you know, <clears throat> that we could actually say that one word to God instead of jump up and say, I hate you. And I, you know. And there are people that do that with me, but that's. <laughs> At me. <laughs> but, but this reality <clears throat> that this is the comprehension of the Lamb. And, and, if, and if the scriptures are true that he was a Lamb before the foundation of the world, and he was a lamb when he walked the earth, and he's a lamb in the book of Revelation, that that is more clearly who he is, not what he does. <clears throat> then it would take not a beautiful earth and a garden of Eden. It would take a really bad situation for us to really see what he's like. So, uh, you know, and in this case, <clears throat> for example, when he says, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Um, he is, in fact, I wrote it right here, Jesus suffered for our sins, which is not just death, but rejection of, by God. Like the scapegoat, he is treated as if he really did do all of those things. He's treated as if he did all of the, anybody, not, you know, just, you know, you know, I don't want to hear, you know, what you did, but has anybody ever done in this room something really, really bad that you're ashamed of that you would just go, oh, my God, anybody? Well, you know, I know for sure I have. I know for sure that Mike and I have. <laughs> And to think that that would be put on Jesus and he would <coughs> be treated as if he did that very thing. No, no, no. Treated by God, the one he loved the most. I mean, it, you know, it's tough being forsaken and despised by people in general, isn't it? I mean, it really is. It, it, it is for me. It's not as hard for me as it once was, but it used to be excruciating for me. But... To have the ones you love forsake you, to look on you and as despised, it, and 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 then, you know, you feel that you know death is one thing, folks. And I'm just going to tell you right now, I'd I'd almost rather just somebody shoot me, than put me through the the mockery of the cross and the despising and the shame that goes with that. You know, you know, because we always talk about Jesus died for us. Well, you know, there was this whole process, <laughs> you know, but we don't get that. We just go, oh, he died, and I died too. That's what Peter said. Oh, you died, and I died too. You know, Jesus said, can you drink the cup? Oh, yeah, yeah. And Jesus said, well, you, you don't have a clue what I'm talking about, but you surely will. Why, 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 why will he? Why will you? Why will I if we continue on to know him? Because the more he gets formed in you, the more it's going to be the sufferings of Christ, not the sufferings of an idiot who fails. Do you understand what I meant by that? That I'm talking about us. We're the idiots who fail. And we can suffer for all of our failures. Or we can suffer as one with him, as, as Christ being formed in us, as the life. But you see... 
why would God put that on you if you're not going to have the self-giving nature that he, ha that he, that he is? You, you know what I mean? I, that would be wrong. Somebody says, well, how come, you know, I mean, that, you know, the Bible talks about persecution, and, and so we go, man, you know, you know, how, how come we never hear about persecution in our country? You know what I mean? I mean, you hardly ever hear about persecution here, you know? And then they say, well, how come, how come I've never really been persecuted? I mean, somebody at work said, you know, Jesus ha, walked off. That's, you know, that's not really persecution, folks. I mean, people would say that about your hairstyle. You'd get about that much if they didn't like it. So, come on. You know, they'd do that to a sinner if they didn't like their hairstyle or clothes or, you know, whatever, you know. <clears throat> I hear worse than that in the workplace, the way people just treat one another in general. And they're not even Christians. They just treat, they treat each other bad, you know. No, 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 no. We're talking about, like Moses, suffering the afflictions of Christ and knowing it <clears throat> and entering into that <clears throat> only by oneness, you know, because we say, oh, I want to be one with Jesus because if, I, if I'm one with Jesus, I have all his resources. I have his patience, which is true, amen? If you're one with Jesus, like a branch to a, a vine, that patience that is Jesus, as it were, flows into you. He is your peace. He is your joy. He is your righteousness. He is, and he flows into you as all of that. And we go, oh, I love this oneness thing. Well, there's several different sides to this oneness thing. You know, <clears throat> the more you become like him, the more darkness dislikes light. Okay. Now, again, you know, who, who would discern that? Who in the wilderness would discern that we are tempting Christ? Who in Egypt would discern we are afflicting Christ? Or, you know, let's just say few, and yet they did. And yet they did. <clears throat> so basically what I'm trying to say is, <clears throat> on that thing, that we are going to have to discern higher than J-E-S-U-S, -S, the, the word. Our, our discernment has got to go deeper than good and evil. We have got to be able, as true Christians, to discern Christ wherever he shows up. You know. You say, well, I... I appreciate Christ and Brother Jim. He, he's sweet-spirited. He's easygoing, and you know he he's he's never really rebuked me. He doesn't say bad things from the pulpit like Randy or something. I don't know. I, I don't know. But I, I just but you know I don't I don't know, man. I don't know about that Mike or I don't know you know about Steve or you know I, I don't I don't know, folks. You, if you can discern Jesus, it's the same Jesus you love. It don't matter what package he's wrapped in. My Lord, this is higher than, you know, being package examiners. This ain't UPS. <clears throat> you know, we should easily detect Jesus wherever he shows up. That's just the way I feel. I'm telling you, I've seen, I remember when Greg first came here and a bunch of people went, well, that, that ain't the Lord. I had a bunch of people tell me that at different times. Well, that ain't the Lord. Look at that guy. And, you know, he was a little more scary then, I guess, than he is now. But, <clears throat> but I mean, he's just a sweet guy, really. He's just a sweet guy that loves the Lord. He really is, you know. And, uh, but, you know, well, he's got earrings and, you know, piercing and bald head and, He's got, you know, he, he listens to na 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 Mohawk. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, you know, first time I met him, I detected, gee, I was at, we were at the National Street Ministers Conference. Met him there, just walked up, we're talking. I went, man, I sense Jesus in this guy. And I'm happy to say that he's told me the same thing later. He said, man, I sense Jesus in that, and my hair was long which is the exact opposite of a punk rocker that he was at. How would we mesh? How would it happen? How could it come together? There's one, and I'm one with him, and I'm one with the him that's in that 
that one, whoever that is. You understand what I mean? But no, no, no. We're all religious. We're, we're all gauging and judging based on what we've been taught and shown and everything instead of off the heart and out of life and out of a real love for Jesus, a real love. And I, when I say that, I'm looking at the body. <laughs> a real love for Jesus. <clears throat> All right, Sam, I'm already talking way too long. My God, I won't even get this first one done. I'm reading now. This is uh, David who, <clears throat> verse 3, <clears throat> uh, this is him before resurrection, so he doesn't, he is going into this rather confused. Okay, and you can see that in the whole thing. Thou art holy, literally in the Hebrew, you are enthroned as the holy one. That's what, when he says thou art holy, he's saying you are enthroned as the holy one. And I wrote, God sits, bet uh, God sits between the cherubim. At this point, all David sees is that he is the holy one, or the only one who is holy. But thou art holy, O thou that inhabitest the praises of Israel. He thinks God inhabits their praises, but does not yet see that they are inhabited based on oneness. Why does, why does he not see that yet? Because the resurrection hadn't started happening in verse 22. Or, yeah. And so um, that takes place by resurrection, which is toward the end of the psalm. In resurrection, the one who inhabits the, and this is in, res, now in resurrection, your praise is completely different. He inhabit, now he inhabits your praises. In resurrection, the one who inhabits their praises is the crucified one who is risen. Amen. He is the one their praises go to. Specifically, not just God in general, not just Messiah or, you know. You understand what I'm saying? The crucified one. The Messiah was the Lamb of God. Okay? Portrayed over and over every year, no, 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 every day in Israel with the death of bunches of lambs every day. You'd think they'd fin figure it out eventually. <laughs> Let's see, since Israel has been, uh, there have been sacrificed 800,253,000,000 lambs. What does that mean? Well, I wonder what that means, you know. You know, you're supposed to figure out that a lamb keeps dying for any and everything you do. Wrong. <clears throat> All right, so this one, this crucified one, is the one who takes up all the room of their specific praises. He inhabits. He takes up all the room of their praises. In other words, there's no just walk around going, oh, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. I hope you caught that. Because a whole lot of Christians walk around going, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. There's no, it's generic. It's, it has no real oomph behind this. It's sort of praise the Lord. Uh, well, who is the Lord? Well, I'll tell you, the book of Revelation said the Lamb is King of kings and Lord of lords. It says the, the Lamb is. That's word, brothers and sisters. <laughs> That's word. <clears throat> All right. Uh, let's read uh, verse 4 through verse 7. Our fathers trusted in thee. They trusted and thou didst deliver them. They cried unto thee and were delivered. They trusted in thee and were not confounded. Okay, I want you to notice those, those next two verses, 4 and 5. He's saying, I mean, do you, did you get what he's saying? He's saying our fathers trusted. They had faith. They trusted in thee and you delivered them. They cried and were delivered. They trusted in thee, and they were not confounded. Now, let me ask you a question. Is that a true statement? Yes. Yes, it is. It is. That, that, you know, God was incredibly faithful to Israel. And they did trust the Lord, and the Lord delivered them time and time and time again. And it's a wonderful reality until you get to the next verse, which is verse 6. But, and is not the word but, that's breaking the chain. It's saying we're going in another direction here. But I am a worm and no man. That's pretty low. A snake crawls on the ground. A worm crawls under the ground. 
I'm a worm and no man, a reproach of men and despised of the people. All they that see me laugh me to scorn. Folks, it's one thing for people to laugh at you. Another thing for them to just mock you to scorn. They shoot out the lip, and maybe you don't know what that means, but my wife and I were missionaries in Jamaica, and they, they had this down. And when you said something to them they didn't like, they would go like this, hmm, and they'd stick their lips out, man. I mean, every one of them, hmm, tough, man. You know, like, Now shoot out the lip. Um, that's the, they shake the head, saying, He trusted on the Lord that he would deliver him. Let him deliver him, seeing he delighteth in him. Folks, that's quoted in Matthew. Okay? All right. Again, if I'm going to make time here, it'd be better if I just read. I'd really like to talk to you a little more about this, but let me just say some preliminary things. David's sufferings were like the cross and not just regular sufferings, and the proof of that is how much this is quoted. The cross is intense grief. All who suffer as sons, meaning a son of God, and that's male or female, suffer according to the cross. Different times, Different people, different circumstances, but acutely the cross, because the cross fits all the godly. Now here's, here's what I mean by that. Jesus hadn't quit ministering. I know it, we say, well, he sat down, so he finished the work, so he quit. I got news for you. He's still, he's still here, and he's here in us. And he still is ministering on the death resurrection basis. When he walked this earth before, folks, he was not ministering on the death, burial, and resurrection basis. He was ministering on the basis of pre-cross, pre-resurrection. Okay? But in resurrection, we're one with him. And everything is settled. Now he's working in, or, or, or what, what has been worked in, he's, we're working it out. What is true already, we are discovering it and living according to that. So it's a whole different basis of relationship. Um, Jesus suffered. Okay, I, I already read part of this. All right, here's, here's the point that I wanted to make. When he said, our fathers trusted in me, they trusted in me, and you delivered them. But I am a worm. I am not delivered. I am in intense grief you are not coming to my aid you came to the aid of Moses you came to the aid of of uh, Isaac you came to the aid of Abraham you came to the aid of these people and you are not coming to my aid okay the fathers trusted in the Lord and got deliverance because their situation was that being just his people who needed help. <coughs> but David and Jesus are not going to get help. This is not just deliverance. This is the cross. You need to see what I just said, that there is a difference between what the fathers went through and what David and Jesus went through. Okay? Uh, they, David, Jesus... Whoever goes through that, they must stay down in death for others. Folks, they must, if others, if you're thinking, if, now if you're just thinking of yourself, God will be faithful to, but if you're going with him into the cross for others, then uh, you have to stay down in death. Okay, let me read on the cross is rejection that must be gone through in death and not by a miracle or deliverance. Why? Because life comes out of death. It says that in 1 Corinthians 15, and this is the principle of God. It is the principle of the Lamb. It's the principle of the cross. It's the principle of the salvation of anyone and Everyone who got saved. Now, they may not live according to it. They may not like it. They may not believe it. But it's the principle that got them saved. <laughs> I 
I mean, I find that, I find that humorous that Christians react against just the thought that life comes out of death when their life and their salvation came out of it. Oh, no, no, no. I just want to hear about blessings and everything else. Well, then let's, let's not listen to the message of Christ and him crucified, and let's just be wilderness wanderers to get God to bless and drop down manna and do everything else and... Live your life on this earth till you drop in the wilderness but have leanness in your soul. That's fine. That's fine. But there is not a Christian that's not born again that didn't come through by one principle. Life comes out of death. And Jesus went into death Amen. so that we could live. And then Paul said this. Death worketh in me but life in you. Uh-oh, wait a minute. Is this thing supposed to apply to us? He said, I bear about in my body the dying of the Lord Jesus. I thought he rose. He did. You're not bearing the 2,000-year-old death. You're, die you're bearing about the nature of self-giving, which we call dying, in your mortal flesh. He's still alive giving himself. Did you hear what I just said? He's alive. He's still alive. He's, a, he's raised from the dead. He's alive in us. Still giving himself unselfishly to death if necessary. Bearing about, because it says that. It doesn't say bearing about in our body the afflictions. It says bearing about in our bodies the dying of the Lord Jesus. That's not someday. That's now. And, and, we're talking about David and Jesus. You can believe that Paul went through this too. All you got to do is read Corinthians. All right, so let me make sure I got this all said here. Life comes out of death. If God delivers them, then no life comes, for life comes out of death. There, there can come a time of confusion because you're so used to being delivered. You're so used to exercising faith and watch God do something. But a new principle is turned now. A new principle is coming to you. An eternal principle. Something that will, will pass through all time and all enemies. It is the principle of the life of the nature of God. And... You don't awaken to that immediately. And so when you start through in this cross thing, and you know, maybe you've been praying for that for years. Oh, Lord, I just want to be made conformable to your death. You ever read that in Philippians? Well, whoever prays that prayer? Well, I'll tell you, Paul did. And then God put Paul, made it where he'd write it down so he could tell all Christians you're supposed to. But nobody's going to do that because we're all selfish and trying to get more for us, you know. My name is Jimmy. I'll take all you'll give me, you know. It's just this grabbing and taking and holding to yourself and stuff like that. <clears throat> okay, so, there, the, so when you're in that situation, you're going, what is, you know, what is wrong? Why won't God help me? Why, why is God treating me this way? It's almost like God's forsaken me. Anybody kind of know what I'm talking about here? Where are you? It's like you've turned your back on me. Well, let's see. Didn't you pray for that? Oh, I didn't know it was going to be this. Because when we say Jesus died for our sins, it's some sort of romantic, beautiful. It's not that everybody treats you like you did everything they did, and they get to blame you for it. <laughs> everything they did they get to blame you for and guess what you can't open your mouth because it's the lamb I mean you could but you'd violate everything and then you, you know then there will be no life for those accusers my lord and let's not go through this for nothing <laughs> I mean let's see some glory out of it you know <clears throat> And, and that's not, but I mean, again, everything's romanticized. So when you start going through it, it's like, oh, my God, you know, 
this is it? I mean, that's almost when you finally start away, you go, this is it? This is nothing like what I thought it was going to be. You know, I thought everybody's going to be applauding me and going, you go. You go. Lay down your life for Jesus. We love you, man. No, they're going, we hate you. You're the cause of all our troubles, you know? <clears throat> all right. Golly, I need to, need to stop talking. All right. Uh, verse 14, and here's a good example of it. My heart is like wax. It melts under the slightest heat. It's unstable fluid. That's verse 14. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted within me. So I wrote, my heart is like wax. It melts under the slightest heat. It's unstable fluid. And here is why. Jesus could have called 10,000 angels at any moment. He could have wiped them all out. But folks, he not only gave up the ability to call angels, he became a man and stayed as a man instead of using his God stuff. And when he did, he was like a man in that he was, it's like wax. And, and I, I'm just telling you, I'm telling you this based on an experience that I've had when I was going through some stuff. It's like, my God, I have no strength at all. I have no, my heart is just melting under the, the heat of this. I am, I am nothing. I am faded away. I am a worm. I am a, you, I mean, you're just going, I am so ashamed. And yet, that's actually part of the process. But we, we think, you know, because I'm brought to such weakness, folks, the weakness of God was the greatest strength that ever was manifest. You know, it says that in Corinthians. That God in his weakest point was stronger than men. <laughs> but, but let me tell you, that weakest point is not fun, and I don't think we usually get it, because that weakest point is not really and truly shame. It is really and truly you have to be brought to absolute nothing, weakness, inability to save yourself. And when you try to stand up for God it's just like the you know you hear something or see something or something happens and you just melt back down and we go oh my god I'm such a shame to the cross I'm such a shame to the Lord and yet that must take place you have to be brought you know you have to be a devastated land and doesn't it say that God will make the desert bloom Amen. anybody ever heard that before did you ever hear it in a song or a sermon and you'd go Whoa! make the desert bloom well it's sure the blooming part will get you excited but wait, you know you're not a desert yet wait till you become that wait till you've gone to the depths and your heart is like wax and you you're so ashamed of yourself you don't know what to do and you you have no ability to stand and the only thing that holds you is the grace of god well i thought that's what we all depend on Right? Don't we all? Oh, I, I totally depend on the grace of God. Yeah. Well, we'll see once we put you through the ringer a few times, you know. When you got nothing, you're depending totally on the grace of God. Amen. All right. And uh, verse 15, my strength is dried up like a potsherd. My tongue cleaveth to my jaw. Now, I want you, one thing, if you'll notice when you go through these scriptures, an incredible thing happens you start actually noticing the effects of literal physical crucifixion. If you know anything about literal physical crucifixion and what it does, it cuts off your air supply, it cuts off your ability to make moisture and stuff, it, you're, you know, you're, you're, it, it just is an excruciating death before death. And this whole chapter is describing the physical effects of crucifixion on a person like what two four thousand years before it was invented and not only that the jews didn't invent crucifixion the romans did and they weren't even a mighty they probably weren't even hardly a people yet And yet, David's going through it with Jesus. Amen. He's going through it. And that's the key, isn't it? Let's, if we're going to go through it, let's go through it with Jesus. Let's not, you know, it's, it's futile otherwise. It's, 
you know, and I say let's stand our ground, about all you got left is just to hang on and hold on. But the resurrection is glorious. Yes, the desert does bloom. But, but can we quit romanticizing everything and go look at a desert? You know, I tell you what, the ranch out there is not a desert. Now, we got cactus and we got sand and we got stuff, but the ranch out there isn't a desert. But you go stand out there for a few days. Right now, I mean, you know. It just pulls the life out of you, the heat, and, the, and it just, it's just incredible the effect that it has on you. Well, wait till you're a desert long enough that you have no juice left. Most of you cannot comprehend no juice left, meaning no oomph in some area. <laughs> you don't have to comprehend it. You'll come to it. But the grace, I mean, I don't even think we understand the grace of God really to any major degree until we've gone through that and then you go, you know what? This is all by grace. Don't tell me you got something or don't, you know, you talk to yourself. Don't tell me you think you're something. This is every ounce by grace. And it was all by grace before, but we think it's us. We think, oh, if it wasn't for my heart for the Lord. Well, this is the man with the heart for the Lord. <laughs> He's going, I'm like wax. I got nothing, baby. <laughs> All right. Uh, verse 16 uh, says, For dogs have compassed me, the assembly of the wicked have enclosed me, they pierced my hands and feet. Now, it's interesting that part that says they pierced my hands and feet, the Hebrew Bible translates that different. The Hebrew Bible translates that like a lion. In fact, even Scofield here probably says something. Yeah, the Hebrew text reads like a line here, but this, and it's, he says it gives no clear meaning. Well, let me tell you something. I think it's clear enough. It's, doesn't the Bible say the devil goeth about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour? He pierced my hands and feet. Let me tell you, the enemy nailed Jesus to that cross also. Like a lion. With all the vengeance and all the power and all of the fierceness. So it's, it's not any sort of mystery to me like it says, you know, here. It's, uh, this gives no clear uh, meaning, it says. <laughs> you know, so, so a Jew would say, it doesn't say they pierced my hands and feet. It says, you know, da-da-da-da. But if you understand the meaning... It's basically saying the same thing. <clears throat> All right. Verse uh, 20. Let's skip on down to there. <clears throat> Deliver my soul from the sword, my only one from the power of the dog. Now, I want you to notice that, uh, l let, me read, let me read the first three words of 20. Deliver my soul. Okay, now, look at verse 21. Save me. Okay, notice it's from what? The lion's mouth, yeah. Okay, but I want you to notice two factors here. One is deliver my soul. The second one is save me. That's the proper order. That's the proper order. One of the things, Lord willing, if we get enough time, I want to go over some major points that the Psalms bring out as a general rule across the board. And one of those is going to be this fact that the psalmist and many of the other people who wrote psalms regularly refer to this little phrase, deliver my soul or save my soul or whatever, um, which is not, you know, get rid of my circumstances. It is my soul is reacting over this. It is like a wild, uncontrolled child. It is wanting this gone. It is wanting relief. Anybody, can anybody identify with this? It, the soul is saying, I don't, God, God, get this off of me. 
didn't get one off, you know, uh, I mean, because it says, for this light affliction worketh for us a far more eternal weight of glory while we look not at the things which are seen, which, but at the things which are not seen. Our workers are being prayed away. This, this affliction works for us. Our workers are being prayed away by us. We have been taught in the church, pray away anything that makes you uncomfortable. Well, then you're going to pray Jesus away. Because <laughs> he's not trying to make you comfortable. He's trying to make you in the image of Christ. That's his biggest desire. It's not just save you from hell. And he did say in the next verse, save me. But the order is save my soul first. Get my soul in line. Redeem my soul. Deliver my soul from this kind of attitude and this sort of reaction. Because, you know, okay. Let's just take a few scriptures. All things work together for good to them who love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. How many of you have ever heard that scripture before? Okay, all things work together for good. Does that mean bad things work together for good? Yeah, all things. Now, how many, how many churches just looked at in the eye and say, guess what? Even the bad things in my life are working for good. Okay, how about this one then? And it, well, let's just before I go on, then let's say this. Then if your soul's freaking out over it, then you need to say, soul, shut up. You, know, you need to say, soul, get in line with the word of God. Have you ever told your soul to get in line with the word of God? Get in line with the word of God. You, you are totally out of order here. You are out of line with my father's word, and you're, you're a disgrace to me. No, because that'd be our spirit talking. And usually it's our soul talking. Lord, why won't you deliver it? Why don't you fix this? Why don't you make Those people are wrong, and they're getting away with all this stuff. You need to, you need to get them. Get them, Lord. Sick them. And so now God's a pit bulldog. Our pit bulldog. Get them! You know. No. He said, in everything give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning who? Concerning you, it says. Well, you know, we judge that. It hit somebody else. Doesn't apply to me. I, do I dodged it. No, it applies to every one of us. In everything, give thanks. But, but here we go again, see? We don't want our soul saved. We want our circumstances fixed so that our soul will be all right. You know? And let's, let's face it, let's put it like this. If God really wanted to just make life better, if that really was all this is about, why didn't he start with being raised from the dead? Go grab the devil and lock him up. Take all the demons, lock them up. Why didn't he start with that? I mean, come on. You'd think God would think of that. No, I'm just, uh, you know, somebody said, that's blasphemy. No. He know, you know, he knows I know why. You know, you may think that's blasphemy because you don't know why. But he's he's not he's not offended at that at all because he's wanting you to ask the same question. Why couldn't Jesus have just risen from the dead, chained up the devil, chained up all demons, killed off all the bad people, and said, "Okay, be happy." be happy you know but he said you know what I am victorious I'm going to let the devil keep running around I'm, I'm trying to make you think I'm trying to make you consider that there might be more to this than what you were told you know I've said this before but we make victory everything What's our definition of victory? The cross didn't look like victory. Daniel and Lion's Den didn't look like victory. Joseph being beaten up and thrown in a ditch by his brothers didn't look like victory. You know, what is victory? One point of victory is, is when your soul doesn't win. 
when the one's going, Lord, you need to give me victory. And then you finally go, you know what? I'm with you. If that's your will for me right now, then I, I give thanks for it. And I trust you for this. Now, there's a higher thing than that. There is a higher thing than that. It's higher than just saying, I trust you in all circumstances. It's being with him in the death so that it brings forth life. Because just trusting him in the circumstances does not automatically bring forth life in others. Life comes out of death. Not trusting God in bad circumstances. Okay? All right. So, um, so the first cry has to be, you know, not Lord fix everyone else, but Lord fix me. That's got to be the first cry. And it's got to be the heart. It's got, to, uh, you know. This isn't just a, a Bible teaching here. My God, this has to become the heart that's formed in every Christian where we say, look, my, you know, I, was, I was thinking about it, uh, I think, tomorrow, this morning, that when it's said and done, for example, with Paul, when he got the end of his ministry, you can read that in, in 2 Timothy. This is, this is one of his last letters. And what does he say? All have forsaken me. The people of Macedonia, wherever, they've turned against me. Asia Minor, they've turned against me. Nobody showed up at my sentencing except for, you know, Luke. Or, or you know, uh, uh, I can't remember. Alexander the coppersmith did me much harm. Uh, you know, he just goes on and on and on. And, you, and this is, you know, he, he's going to die soon. And it's like, uh, this really didn't work out the way I thought it was going. However, I think it did work out the way he thought. But that's what we do. <clears throat> when we get down to the end of our life, you start measuring things differently. And you come to a realization. Get ready. You come to a realization that the only thing that you truly have power over to change in this world is yourself. You, you can try it with your kids. You can try it. You can try it with <laughs> But I mean, you know, you, 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 and you'll, you know, and you can try it with others and whatever. But what's funny is we think we're the saviors of the world instead of the, the material that's being worked on. You know, we think it's all about them. And God's going, you get to the end of your life, and he goes, you know, you could have been more conformed to my image than what you are, but you're too busy working on everybody else. That's, that, that's shocking, you know. But if you just realize the only, because I have, I have the, the wheel of this car, I have the will of this being, I have the heart that can say, Lord, I'm, I'm going to quit worrying about everybody else. My God, I need you. <laughs> My Lord, I desperately need you. Look at me. I'm, I'm probably freaking out more than they are. <laughs> you know? And that's what, you know, that's what David and others says. I went by the, the, the home of the, the wicked, and they were all happy, and their kids seemed fine. And everything. Have you ever read that? And you go, that ain't right. Well, it only bugs you because you ain't right. <laughs> That's right. It only bugs you because you're not right. <clears throat> all right. So, so he says, deliver my soul, not just my circumstances. But then in the next verse, he does say, save me. Um, verse 21 Save me from the lion's mouth, for thou hast heard me from the horns of the wild oxen. All right, so there is this place for God to move in your circumstances, but listen very carefully. Do not confuse your circumstances with the cross. If it is the time of the cross, he's not going to deliver you, and you don't need to be asking for it. You need to stay down in death so that life can come to others. You know, 
Now, if it's just, if it's not the cross, if it doesn't have anything to do with the life of Christ, if, if the enemy, you know, your enemies have done something to you, then trust God and your faith will deliver you just like he said. You know, our fathers trusted you and you delivered them. Well, just, you know, just go there. Just go. But if it's not the case, go with the Lord. All right, we're going to go ahead and stop. I made it to the first half. The second half is not, and here's.